If you're a pop culture junkie who loves TV, film, music, comedy, and other really important stuff, then you've come to the right place. Get ready and settle in for Classic Conversations, the best pop culture interviews in the world. That's right, we circled the globe so you don't have to. If you're ready to be the king of the water cooler, then you're ready for Classic Conversations with your host, Jeff Dwoskin. All right, Lily, thank you so much for that amazing introduction. You get this show going each and every week, and this week was no exception. Welcome, everybody, to episode 300 of Classic Conversations. As always, I am your host, Jeff Jawaskin, so excited to have you back for what's sure to be an amazing conversation to celebrate number 300. Butch Patrick is here. That's right. Eddie Munster himself talking the Munsters, Lidsville, and so much more. And that's coming up in just a few seconds. And in these few seconds, comedian Deanne Smith was here last week. Do not miss that amazing conversation. But right now, we're going full Munster. I had such a great time talking to Butch Patrick. Can't wait to share it with you and celebrate number 300. Here we go. Enjoy. All right, everyone. I'm excited to introduce you to my next guest. Loved him in Lizville. The Real McCoys, and of course, Eddie Munster from the Munsters. Please welcome to the show, direct from 1313 Mockingbird Lane, Butch Patrick. Hey. Is that guy still alive? (laughs) There's a rumor he is, (laughs) yes. (laughs) How are you, Jeff? I am good. I feel like we're besties. We've talked so many times on the phone now. Thanks for hanging with me on my podcast. No problem. Not a problem. All right. So, you know... Like everyone, I grew up watching you, so it's pretty awesome to to be able to hang out with you and talk about the monsters and all the other cool stuff that you've done. Kathy Garver, who introduced us, kind of the one thing that I noticed it was like true for both of you, you both carry the mantle of your shows. I mean, you and Pat Priest probably as well, but like she's family affair. Like she writes the books, she does this, she, she kind of keeps that going. Uh-huh. And you do that too. I mean, that's, you're at all the cons, you're, you're taking the, the Munster Mobile and the Dragula and you're just, you're keeping that memory and all the magic of the show of the Munsters alive. You know, I'm very, very lucky, blessed, whatever, however you want to place it, that number one, growing up in a period, I was born in 1953, I had a great window of life to work with. You know, my early years were in the 50s. So I had a, you know, as a kid, I saw the early days of television and I saw Elvis and I saw a lot of stuff happening. But in the 60s, when the uh, transition of black and white to color and the Beatles and music and movies and television, it was a really great pop culture decade. And that's one of the reasons why today, 60 years later, people are, can't get enough of it and people respond well to it. And it brings back fond memories and they like kids and their grandkids to hopefully see what they what they enjoyed as a kid because uh it's something they can all get together on i just because i had a i I was a gearhead and i grew up through muscle cars and dirt bikes and you know everything that was cool to do kind of back then is still cool to do now and it's just the fact that i happen to be you know six fifty sixty years older but i'm still a kid at heart i still feel young and i'm you know and the thing is when i go out and 35, 40 years ago, when people started putting together these conventions to uh, ask celebrities to come, per- not perform, but to meet, greet, and, and sit and meet with people to help them, uh, you know, draw uh, attention and, and attendance. The Munsters was front and foremost a very family friendly show, multi generational. And me and Al Lewis and Pat Priest started doing it. So with uh, Grandpa Marilyn and Eddie out there, and then obviously, you know, Al died at 06, and Pat kind of got off the circuit because she's older and she's up in Idaho. But me with my cars, I found a very interesting way of, uh, I love the road, I love Americana, I like uh, doing what I do, and it's just morphed into a, a very cool thing that I'm still doing today, as you know. Is the Monster Coach and the Dragula that you have one of the original ones, or are they replicas? No, the original Dragula is in my car club, a car club named Dead Man's Curve, which is in New Jersey. A John, a gentleman named John Spurgato has a company called TV Show Cars, and he's got 24 world-class cars. Some of them, most of them are the originals. He's got a number three coach. He's got the number one Dragula. My Dragula is an exact replica, but with more horsepower. Because modern day technology, uh, the same engine in 1964 that generated 300 horse 
today I get almost 500 out of it, but no one would ever know unless I told them. My Munster coach, it's being built right now. I had one, but it was a Chevy engine. So my two new cars are all very accurate, George Barris. And there's another key name to be involved with was growing up with the uh, Barris family, George Barris, Joji, you know, his first son, Jared, the whole Barris clan. I was very lucky to be around a lot of cool stuff as a kid, and it still has allowed me to do a lot of things today. And it's, especially even in drag racing, when I was 15, 16, 17 years old, going to the drag strips and stuff, I was, uh, I had a very good life. I've had a very good life. George Barris. So do you knew George Barris personally? Oh, yeah. I went, I, I went all over the world with George. Oh, that's yeah, not... Jordan was like Uncle Uncle George to me, and I was like an adopted son to him. And I'm still, like I say, I'm still very close to Joji and her husband Barry mm -hmm. and her son Jared and Brett, the son. But yeah, it was it was a wonderful time, and the shop was only a mile away from the studio. And one of my Wednesday treats was to leave the studio lot to go have a hot dog at Toddy's, which was across the street from George's, and then go to the hobby shop because slot cars were all the rage back in the '60s, uh, home slot car tracks and. I'd go get my slot car track and go visit George and have my hot dog and see him on a weekly basis, whether the Munster coach was being brought to the studio or not. That's how close we were. So did you also hang out with the Batmobile? Not so much the Batmobile. Now, Munster's was over. Basically, I moved to the Midwest with my grandmother. By the time I came back to do more work, Batman was off the air. But I certainly saw the Batmobile around at car shows and stuff. But, you know, obviously, no, I never, uh, I wasn't really around the Batmobile, although I was Saturday, the last day, was being shipped off to when it got auctioned off about, I think it was about, about 10 years ago, 12 years ago. It was funny. I had stopped by the shop just to say, say hi. And the Batmobile was there, so I got a chance to jump in, and I had no idea it was going off to set the record for the most expensive car ever to be auctioned at uh, Barrett-Jackson. George Barris had quite the flair for iconic. He really did. He was, a, he was a, an innovator, and he was a showman, and he was a marketing genius. He started with actual real just... 50 Mercs and, you know, chopping cars and making customs. And then when the, you know, the black and white movies of the, of the, the drive-in movie craze of the late fifties, he placed a lot of cars in those drag strip movies and sweater girls, and, you know, kind of like a sort of a soft T and a TNA and juvenile delinquent cars and this and that thing. He built those. But when television came around, he was all over that, like putting his, uh, his name and his, and his, uh, his stuff on, on TV cars. But more than that, he did personal cars for all the famous stars in Hollywood. That's where he really, everybody who was anybody in Hollywood, whether it was Frank Sinatra or Elvis or Dean Martin, all had a, a Barris custom. Incredible. I was just at the Motor City Comic Con and they had a Monster Coach replica there that you could take pictures with and all that kind of good stuff. That and Kit and... Uh... <laughs> yeah, that's the car. That's that's John's. That's, uh, that's a car from my car club. So before the Monsters, you were discovered with your sister. Was your sister already kind of in the industry and she, I know she dragged you along to one of the photo shoots. You know, I'm, I'm older than my sister. What happened was Mary Grady, who at that time was working for an adult agency, you know, normal agency featuring, kid, there was no kid agencies back then. She decided to become the first child only agent and her son was on My Three Sons, Don Grady, playing Robbie. But when she opened up her own agency, she had no clients in. My mom, her friend knew Mary Grady, and they were looking at my little sister to have some photos taken for modeling. And that particular day, uh, I guess the babysitter wasn't around or I had nothing to do. But for some reason, I wound up going on that ride with them to the photographer, Amos Carr, up in Hollywood. And it's funny, the uh, they were done. Amos Carr, I don't know, it took a thought I had a good look or an expression or something. But he said, may I take a couple pictures of your son? My mom said, yes. He put a picture in the window of his studio. And a couple of weeks later, a producer and a director were walking by and noticed the look. We're still looking for the youngest son of Eddie Albert and Jane White for a little movie they were doing. And they sought me out and went on an interview with no experience. Told them that, of course. They said, you got to start somewhere. And they hired me on the spot for my first job, which was a, a movie where I worked six weeks with Eddie Albert, Jane White, Soupy Sales. Brenda Lee was my older sister. She was 15 years old. And by the time the movie was over, I had picked up a Kellogg Cornflakes commercial and a, uh, and a stint on uh, General Hospital. The first year it was on, the first episode ever. That's quite some early success. So the movie was Two Little Bears. Uh -huh. Do you still eat cornflakes to this day out of respect for them uh -huh. hiring you? <laughs> <laughs> no, I did cornflakes, then I did frosted flakes, then I did Fruit Loops. I did a lot of commercials. And back in the early 60s, I was doing a lot of Westerns and Ben Casey's and Untouchables. And Detectives Edward G. Robinson played my grandfather. And anyway, I was very busy. Uh, I, I could have been busier, but I, I chose to like 
pick and choose. I like staying home. I like going to regular school, being around my friends and playing baseball and little league and this and that. So I didn't really do as much work as I probably could have, but I did enough to where I was happy. And, uh, and I think that it worked out well for everybody. So when you're seven and you're in a movie with Eddie Albert and Soupy Sales and you're doing cornflakes commercials and you're still going to school, this is before the monsters. How are the kids acting with you at school? Like what's that, what's that engagement like? Yeah. Kids in school are, are kids. And you know, when you're on TV and you're doing movies and stuff, there will be some that will admire you and there will be some that will want to befriend you. And then there's a lot of them that don't know what to do with you. So they make fun of you or, you know, there's, you know, whatever uh, kids, it's, it's, it's difficult to go to school anyway. Bullying took place back then, like any, like it does today, but I had thick skin and I didn't let it bother me. And once they figure out that they're not getting a rise out of you, it pretty much goes away fairly quickly. So I went about my business and did what I needed to do. And then, uh, like I said, I did the real McCoys, which was a year before the Munsters. Then I went to live with my grandmother in Illinois. And then I came back from Illinois to do the Munsters. And then I went back and lived in Missouri in the eighth grade with my grandma. So I had this balance of Hollywood and Los Angeles with small town America and Illinois and Missouri which I think helped me not only achieve a balance, but it also gave me appreciation of Americana. And it also keeps me like today, I enjoy driving cross country and doing stuff on the ground with my cars. You know, obviously I can't fly with them. So it sort of forced into a balance between road trips and air travel. I'm right now living in Arkansas, in a medium-sized city that has a small town feel. Back in the time where they take your picture, did you want to be an actor or you're like, all right, take my picture. And then you start getting all these things. Is this something that you really wanted? No, it was something that came very naturally and easy to me. I never took an acting lesson. I wanted to be a race car driver. And I was smart enough to know as a kid that the money that I was making would come in handy if I ever wanted to do that. It was never a career. It was always a temporary series of temporary jobs. And I think that's another reason why I did well, because I never took it too seriously. The memorization was easy and hanging around adults was easy and riding a horse was easy. So I had a lot of luck. And, you know, they say when you get into the business, there's, there's a lot of rejection, which I'm sure there is for a lot of people, but I was lucky. And, you know, I did, I did a reasonable amount of work, but like, you know, I was no Bill Mooney. I mean, Bill Mooney was like really, really working a lot. And a few other kids, the corporates over at Disney. And there was a few kids that worked a lot, but I helped, you know, I, I did, I did pretty good for 15 years. My credit list is pretty, pretty solid. Pretty solid indeed. What other kid actors were you hanging out with at that time? Zero. Zero. I lived a long way away from the studios and there were no other. Paul Peterson happened to live in Gardena, but I never even met him until we were in our late 30s. So no, no, I didn't hang around with kids, uh, kid actors. You would go on interviews. It would be the only time you would see them. And then I would drive back home or you'd go to work at the studio. So it was a very much of a dual situation. I was living in the in the beach district of Los Angeles called the South Bay area, which was a very nice area, 25 miles out of the uh, Hollywood area. But um, at the same time, there was a long drive to interviews, and which probably kept me from going on more interviews than I would have, that my, my mom would have liked me maybe to have done more. But it was a lot to give up a baseball game, get in the car, drive an hour, traffic, do the interview, come back and, and do more traffic. I kind of was selective to the ones that I did. Got it. And then along comes the monsters. They call you in, you do a screen test with Yvonne. Well, there's a little bit more backstory to that. Uh, okay. They had actually cast the show. I was living with my grandmother, as I said, in Illinois after the real McCoys. My mom had married a baseball player with the California Los Angeles Angels back then, before they were the California Angels. And they got married and uh, they uh, basically, he was traded to the Washington Senators. So my mom, my sister, and my two infant brothers from Kenny all moved to Washington, D.C. We kept the house in California, but since I was the only one there, I went with my grandmother to go live in Illinois, which was fine. I was I looked forward to it. And then the interview with after they had cast the show, Ronnie, excuse me, Bill Mooney was their first choice. And he turned it down because he had other plans to do something else. So that that he said thanks, but no thanks. Then they cast the kid named Happy Derman, Nate Happy Derman, into it for the pilot. The network saw the pilot. They greenlit it for production. They said we want to change the mom. She looks too much like Morticia from the Adams family. Her name was Joan Marshall. 
And they also didn't like the kid's characterization of Eddie. So they go bring in Yvonne DiCarlo and bring in another kid. And my agent caught wind of that, Mary Grady, convinced them to fly me from Illinois to the studio for a screen test. So I didn't even go, I didn't even have an interview or a reading or anything. I went directly to a screen test, which was pretty unusual at that point for uh, a 10 year old kid. They said, okay, make arrangements to report to work. I had nobody out there except my uncle Woody, and I had moved in with him, and we hired a woman to take me to work every day. So that's pretty much how it went for the next two years. And once a month, I would fly back to D.C. to go visit my mom and my family. Incredible story. They had the original pilot. Were they, when they were filming the pilot for The Monsters, then were they very aware that The Addams Family was in full production? Because the debut of both your shows were like within a week apart. They were aware. The people that did the Leave it to Beaver were looking for a, a new project. The Monsters, a comedy of families of monsters had actually been a cartoon I did by Bob Clampett. In the 50s, he had conceptualized that never saw the light of day. And then when they caught wind of the Adams Family and they were looking for a project, they decided to resurrect that idea. The Universal Studio was known for monsters. They, they were the monster studio in the 30s and 40s. So what they did is they took the Leave it to Beaver family-friendly scripts and kid-friendly, applied them with the Universal Monsters and makeup and special effects, and took the best of both worlds and created this very offbeat, one-off family unique one-of-a-kind show that turned out to be a hit yeah it did i didn't realize when i was kind of researching like so the, you had the first pilot with uh joan and then they replaced her with yvonne and then mm -hmm. happy made it to those two and then you replaced him in a third pilot and then they made a fourth pilot no what i read was that they, the fourth pilot had you less spoiled your character no i don't believe i did the fourth part i don't think I, I that's the first i've heard of that all i know is we went i went directly into the first episode we went into production full on and the only thing they did they stopped on first day because i didn't have a widow speak and i didn't have bushy eyebrows and there was only one scene with me without that makeup on is where Grandpa's Love Potion, A Man from Maryland. Maybe it's not A Man from Maryland. Maybe it's Sleeping Cutie or whatever. The first episode, they shows the, the Love Potion, Herman, next door neighbor loves Herman. John Fiedler, the mailman, falls in love with Lily. And I come running home, school, with a bunch of girls chasing behind me. And if you look really closely, you'll see me without a widow speak and without my eyebrows. They stop production. They go, we need him to look more believable as an offspring of Herman and Lily. He looks too normal. The ears aren't enough. So Mike Westmore made a hairpiece and then put eyebrows on me. And that's the new Eddie. That's how that went. And there was no pilot. It was strictly a full 24-minute episode. The iconic Willow's Peak. Yeah, I think uh, Grandpa was making that love potion for Marilyn. Yeah, and she didn't, didn't eat breakfast that day. Right. So they poured it back into the family, uh, the family pot. They were worried that gorgeous Marilyn wouldn't be able to land a man. <laughs> yeah, Beverly was, she was a cutie. I had such a crush on her. Why did Beverly end up leaving? She was, and then Pat Priest replaced her after 13 episodes. She was told by, she was a New Yorker. She was in love with the guy that was producing Captain Kangaroo. And her agent told her to go out and take the paycheck that the show would never get picked up. It would be a week's work and she'd be back in a week. And her agent lied to her. Maybe didn't lie to her, but kind of convinced her that there was no chance that the show would be successful. And it was successful. And then, and then Beverly was stuck in L.A., kind of like me. And she moved in and lived with Fred Gwynn and his wife, Foxy. She needed a place to stay because she was totally caught off guard by the success as well. And then after 13 weeks of her being miserable, Fred and Al told the producers, you need to let her go back to New York. This is like literally harsh and unusual punishment. They said, no way. She's an integral part of the success of the show. And we're not letting her go. And Fred and Al said, if you don't let her go, we'll quit. And then you won't have a show at all. So they pretty much went to her defense and strong arm the producers into letting her go. Pat Priest stepped in, clothes fit. The wig went on. And although no, Pat was a blonde, Beverly wore the wig. You know, it was a pretty easy transition. A lot of people weren't even aware there were two Marylands. Yeah, I'm not sure I was either. I guess it depends which episode you watched, you know, like in syndication. It was only the first 13. So if you only caught like those other episodes, I mm -hmm. think it would probably just depend how much. And then as a kid noticing one blunt. <laughs> well, there's a, there's a definite difference in the 13 episodes of the storyline and plot development of how that went. Because originally it was very much structured that Beverly was front and center about the storylines were always about trying to find love and boyfriends coming to the house and running away and being scared. And, you know, her thinking that she was the problem. And when she left the show, that became a little more of a backstory at the more of the day-to-day -day existence of Herman and Lily and Grandpa in the dungeon getting into mischief 
And Pat Priest, the Marilyn Monroe character, took a few steps back and wasn't quite the center of attention as it was when Beverly did it. So you mentioned that Beverly's uh, agent or, or publicist lied to her to take the job. But what was the expectations? I imagine they must have been pretty high. I mean, Fred and Al were coming off car 54. So there, have mm-hmm. to, there had to have been some kind of heat that they're, they have this great chemistry team coming into this, this new show. On paper, it's funny that, you know, you can never really, you know, it's like lightning in a bottle. You never know when it's going to hit. The show's success, there was a lot of things that went on. I mean, there was good writing. There was good acting. There was, there was a lot of good stuff. But the bottom line was, in my opinion, that it was actually a believable family unit. People actually felt like that was a family, that they were having the trials and tribulations, that it was like, they, well, I get it all the time. People felt, they tell me, they go, I wanted so much to be part of your family. You guys had the coolest house and you had the coolest this, but it was mainly a believable family unit, aside from the fact that he looked like Frankenstein. You never thought of him as Frankenstein. You thought of him as Herman Munster and Lily Munster and Grandpa Munster. There was never Dracula, Vampira, anything. Uncle Gil was not the creature. Uncle Lester wasn't the wolf man. It was, it was very amazing how the characters resonated through the makeup and you forgot all about the visuals. You enjoyed it because it was funny and it made for interesting storylines and, and it made for interesting, you know, people, uh, they could write scripts that would be very funny that weren't really wouldn't be funny outside of the fact that the monsters were the monsters and that's what made it funny. It had this very unique dynamic and it was wonderful. And then, and then I watch it because now, because I like listening to the music and I like listening to the, the sound and the Foley artist and all the stuff that went along with it. The secondary stuff is what I find interesting. And, and there was not a weak link in it. I mean, it was a strongly well done produced show quality. Oh, absolutely. I And I agree with you. It's like, I think you don't think of them as monsters because like Al Lewis, he just seems like a crazy grandpa or crazy relative. <laughs> just he happens to be able to make things float and make potions. <laughs> yeah, it, it made for great writing. It was a good time for comedy writers. It was a good time for comedians to come on and guest star. We had a lot of top notch comedians, Paul Lynn, Don Rickles, Harvey Corman, Jesse White, Frank Gorshin. We had yeah, there was no shortage of really good people on the show. Yeah, I was I was watching um, the Eddie's nickname episode again, and yeah, Paul Lynn was the doctor, <laughs> Doctor Dudley. Yep, yeah, that was a great episode. You get a beard, you got a full on beard, you got to. That's a hilarious. That's a very funny episode, and 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 I tell you, the funniest thing about it is when I'm sitting in the dress in the waiting room with Herman, and he's reading, and I'm sitting with his paper bag over my head mm-hmm. with his little beard sticking out, and and he peeks out, and he sees him, and he goes. Oh my goodness, Mr. Munster had the guts to have a son. Could you imagine what he must look like if they have to cover his face with a paper bag? You know, it's like, <laughs> oh my God, it was, just, it, was, it was a very funny episode. Too funny. And, and touching as well. I mean, just the whole speech that Herman gives yep. you about people accepting people no matter what oh, they look Oh, that like. one at the end. Yeah, yeah, that's 150 million views. Yeah. Oh my gosh. That's, yeah, that's probably one of the most words of wisdom, father and son, even at the end of the thing, grandpa that always ribs him. He goes, Herman, they ain't perfect. But you're all right. You know, he gives, <laughs> him the, he gives him the old, you're all right. It's always some moral, moral, uh, something to be learned. Uh, some, uh, any, you know, father and son wisdom handed down. It's always the good stuff. Yeah. But that's another great example of what you were saying earlier, where he's, you know, Lily tells him to go speak to you, Herman, to go speak to you, father, son, because you're upset. Yes. And he does. And he's awkward about it. You know, it's like it's very relatable, very relatable. Yeah. What happened was, is uh, a lot of times in series, kids, sometimes they, you know, like there's a, a lot of times in a series, a kid gets buried behind the adults. He doesn't really have the same amount of dialogue at screen time. It's just the way it is sometimes. There are exceptions to it. And this was one of them because what they did is they found that he was my hero. He never wanted to disappoint me. And I was, he was the large childlike seven foot tall monster. And I was the adult like half size, his little boy. So they wrote scripts that allowed us to meet in the middle and have conversations. And a lot of times it would be me being the student and sometimes it would be him being the student and me being the teacher. And they wrote a lot of scripts that way because I could handle dialogue. And they found that the father and son dynamic was strong and they liked that. And then grandpa, sometimes it would be grandpa and me. So I was very lucky that because I could handle it and, and, and it worked out well. And it was believable that they wrote several scripts that featured Eddie. That's, actually, that's really cool that they could hone in, kind of take advantage of, of all your uh, all your talents and, and everyone's strengths. 
Sorry to interrupt. Have to take a quick break. Do want to thank everyone for their support of the sponsors. When you support the sponsors, you're supporting us here at Classic Conversations. And that's how we keep the lights on. And now back with Butch Patrick. What was it like just being on the studio as a kid? Well, it was great. You know, when I did the book Monster Memories, when they got around to ask my memory for uh, content, I said, you know, my memory of the monsters was, uh, that was kind of like my job and I enjoyed going to work. But my favorite memory of that two-year period was when I had free time and I could go wander around the studio and go see what everybody else was up to. Because, you know, Universal takes about three months to do a movie. We had like 12 sound stages going active. So that's 50 movies a year for two years. So during my stay, there was 100 movies that were produced on the lot. Not to mention three Westerns, Gunsmoke, Virginia, and Laredo, Alfred Hitchcock, maybe another series or two that I can't recall. So that was my favorite thing to do was to go wander around and go see what Mike Westmore was making in the lab at the makeup department, go see what the special effects guys were doing and, and go see what everybody else was up to. Can you imagine how much fun that would be for a 12, you know, 11, 12 year old little boy in full makeup, knowing that I can go anywhere on the lot because I'm supposed to be there. It's not like anybody's going to step up and say, Hey, well, you know, go away. Right. And half of them probably excited to see Eddie Munster. <laughs> yeah, no, it was great. It was the one, that was the most fun that I had, like go to stage 28 and go Phantom of the Opera soundstage, largest soundstage in Hollywood and climb up, you know, where you're not supposed to go and be in the catwalk six stories up. That was cool. That sounds amazing. Yeah, that must have been quite a just a playground for like a 12 year old. <laughs> Insane. Yeah, and it, and it was. It was fun. Uh, good times. You had to do your job. You had to be prepared. But uh, when you had a little free time, it was wonderful. I read that Batman played a role in sort of the cancellation of it. Like, yeah. Because Batman screwed up not just then your show. It also kind of messed with Lost in Space, you know, where both of you guys were in black and white. And then this colorful new show comes along and like they had to change. So their third season became color. What did you think the direct impact of Batman was on the Munsters? We were prepared to go to color, but the issue was who was going to pay for it, whether it would be the studio, the network, or the producers. And honestly, I think three things came into play. I think number one, Fred and Al were from New York. I think they were ready to go back home. I think the show was starting to, the scripts were getting a little thin. Best was behind us. And the solution was to do Munster Go Home in color and call it a day after two years, which I think was a wise thing to do. I don't think the Munsters would have worked well in color. It was a black and white genre. The, monster, the great monster movies were in black and white. And just because the technology was there and everybody was buying color TVs, I think it worked out really well the way it should have. And whether Batman caused it or whether the finances caused it, I'm happy the way it worked out. We did a color movie. They showed it around the world. Everybody knew who the Munsters were. They started watching it in black and white. And everybody, I think it worked out just great. Yeah, I think there's a brilliance to the show being in black and white, especially as as an homage to the, all the, the universal mm -hmm. characters that it's that are yeah. part of. Monsters Go Home, that was the movie they did sort of for syndication, right, to, for other countries to kind of introduce people to the monsters. Did you keep up with any of the reboots? I know you weren't in them, but I mean, did you watch them? Did you? No, I had seen them. Well, I was in them. One of the, you know, we all did a cameo in the one in the early 90s with Edward Herman and Lee, uh, not Lee Merriweather, with uh, the girl from Hill Street Blues. I can't think of her name at the moment. But that one was okay. The Monsters Today, the series with John Shuck and Lee Merriweather and Jason Marsden. You know, it was it was what it was. You know, it, 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 it was it served a purpose. It was the 80s. It was in color and people liked it. You know, it was on for three years. The guy, Arthur Schwartz, who's Sherwood Schwartz's son, did the uh, did Gilligan and, and the Brady's put it together. So, you know, they knew what they were doing. And the other movies, Scary Little Christmas, uh, the Rob Zombie movie I was involved with. That was probably the best one of the group because of the going back and doing the history of how Herman and Lily met. You know, there was actually a purpose to it. Right, right, right. One little thing I found totally irrelevant trivia, but you know, Ben Stiller loved doing Eddie Munster on. Oh yeah, the Saturday Night Live thing, sure. Yeah, but then Christine Taylor, his wife, was was uh, Marilyn in uh, in the Here Come the Monsters in '95. Yep, so. yep, absolutely. Also, Marsha in the Brady's. Right, right, exactly. I just thought it was funny. They must sit around loving the Monsters in that household. <laughs> do you remember doing? Marine Land Carnival with the Munsters? I'll tell you I do, and I'll tell you why. That was done down at Marine Land, which before SeaWorld and all the aquarium places, that was the only place in the country that had anything like that. And it was down by where I lived. It was near It was near my house. 
And I was a big fan of an old TV show called Sea Hunt with Lloyd Bridges as Mike Nelson. And that was all done at Marineland. So that was, for me, it was not only close to home, but it also was the, the home of the series that I really enjoyed. So I, yeah, I remember it very vividly. Okay. I just, I found it. I just, I was searching and I stumbled on it and I was like, all right, <laughs> some funny stuff with Al Lewis with, on top of a flagpole, but well, not him, but they make you think about it being him. So, um, oh, you know, another show that you were in that I love, one of my favorite shows, uh, The Monkees. You were in the Christmas special of The Monkees. Yeah. You know, it, a couple of things jump out on my resume. One of those is The Monkees Christmas episode. I was in the eighth grade. The Beatles had come to the set of the Munsters. I missed them. I was bummed that I didn't get a chance to meet them. Monkeys at the time, when I did the episode, they were as popular as the Beatles were, maybe even more so in America because of the nature they had the TV show. The music was solid. And I really, I normally wouldn't really care if I got a part when I went on an interview. It didn't really matter to me one way or the other. I, I tried my best. You know, usually I would get the part, but this one I really put a little extra effort into it because I really wanted to do it. And I wound up getting it. And I normally in school, I wouldn't tell anybody what I was up to. But that particular week, I told everybody what I was doing. <laughs> the funny part about it was it was like the episode was really all about Melvin being taught the meaning of Christmas by the monkeys. So it was like I got to work with them a lot. You know, it wasn't just a little walk on like, oh, I was on the monkeys and I needed, there I am back. No, this was like front and center dealing with the monkeys and, uh, and being like they're, uh, you know, they're equal for the for the three day shoot. Yeah, they were like babysitting you, or they were right. They yeah. were, yeah. So it was great. It was, it was, it was one. Of, it was one of my favorites. And then another one that comes to mind that, that happened around the same time was the uh, Phantom Tollbooth, which was Chuck Jones, the crazy great animator of all the cartoons that I loved as a kid and and, and a teenager. Uh, working with him and all the voiceover people in this great movie called The Phantom Tollbooth that is based on Norman Juster's book. Mandatory reading in a lot of schools, a lot of a lot of classrooms. I get a lot of people when I go to conventions, they bring out their books and they go, I love that movie. That's one of my favorite books and movie. And thank you for being Milo. So that was kind of cool. That kind of falls into the thing. And then you got a little later down the road. I did nine episodes of My Three Sons. I was just the most of any guy guest star, any male guest star on the series. That was the most episodes anybody ever did. And then I did Lidsville a little bit after the last My Three Sons. Or Sid and Marty Croft, which at the time I didn't think was really much to do. But in hindsight, I guess that was a very lucky break for me because uh, Charles Nelson Riley and Billy Hayes and, and the Crofts are huge, you know, and I wasn't aware of them at the time. But now, uh, now I'm glad I did it. Lidsville is, I mean, I... <laughs> I mean, you got to really be on something to be watching Lids. Like uh, you jump into a hat, you go into a land of hats. The, the Crofts had an imagination like I, like no one else. <laughs> yeah, no, it was definitely like Alice in Wonderland falling yeah. down the rabbit hole. It was cool. Uh, and the funny thing about it, all the little people, the hat people, I, I knew most of them because growing up as a kid, you get a lot of stand-ins, you know, stand-ins for you. They don't have another kid stand in for another kid. You always have little people. So when the hats came off, but three or four of those people I already knew. So that was fun. Oh, so I mentioned earlier, kind of like how you keep Munsters alive and the, the cons and all that kind of stuff. I found a clip from something called Christina's Court. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right, yeah. Where you that, were that's... suing Mickey Keats and yeah. you won the URL rights for Munsters.com. Yeah. The thing I found funny about this show is it's, it's a courtroom drama. But, yeah. you know, and it opens up and it says, uh, Christina's direct and fair, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> but then she's like, oh, my God, it's Eddie Munster. We have a clip from the show. <laughs> yeah. I just thought it was so funny. <laughs> that was. It was, you know, it was funny, too. It was, it, was, it was so scripted. First, Mickey wanted to be the defendant. Then he wanted to be the plaintiff. And it was, you know, it was all pre-done. It was, you know, the, the, the verdict was in. Whatever happened, you know, I get my site back. And whatever the damages are, they pay. Uh, it was very much, but it was funny as Mickey was, he's just such an idiot. I'm fairly savvy with how to, ha you know, handle yourself in a courtroom situation. There's certain, and he was just, he just came off as a buffoon, you know, so it was, it was hilarious. Yeah. It was <laughs> finding like old gems like that, just randomly on YouTube. It's like one of the greatest well, Greatest well, the funny, part, the funny part about it, funny part, we had a lot of mutual friends and they used that clip when they, when he said, I have a crush on Butch Patrick. Then that was, <laughs> the, that was the little clip that they kept putting into the trailers for the, and watch Christina's court. I have a crush on Butch Patrick. <laughs> 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 and he got so ridiculed by everybody over that. <laughs> oh, man. So Butch, after the Munsters, 
people always talk about, you know, kid stars and, you know, and drugs and all that kind of stuff. And, and you had your, your go around with that and you, you're a survivor, right? I mean, you, after decades of, of battling all that Mm -hmm. came out, you're not one of those cautionary tales. You're a, a positive outcome story. What do you credit? Who do you credit? Like, for helping you get out of that and get sober and all that? Well, you know, it was the 60s. And to start with, you get into it for the party situation and the fun and the games and all the good stuff that went along with being in the cool scene at the time. But you got to remember back then, uh, well, you, you weren't old enough to remember this probably, but it was accepted behavior back then. I was, When I did um, the Phantom Toll booth, we were up in San Francisco shooting the live shots. I mean, hate Ashbury, the Grateful Dead and, and Woodstock. And this was, this was, this was America. It was the hippie movement. Make love, not war. Everybody was getting stoned. Everybody was getting high. Cocaine came into play shortly after, but it was just the way things were, you know, and get started up into it. Some people, found it not to be something they liked. I enjoyed it. I was good at it. And I also living, I'm wanting to be accepted by everybody around me instead of being an actor. I threw the best parties and always had stuff around and and just became a lifestyle that unfortunately lasted longer than it should have. But I survived it and wasted a whole lot of money and never got my, never became a race car driver and probably did some things that, you know, that if, if things had been different, I'm sure things, you know, obviously uh, we wouldn't be talking about this in the, in the text here, but there are no, you know, there are no mistakes. When you get sober, you have to accept your, your fate and you're right where you're supposed to be. And good news is I got, it'll be 13 years coming up, total sobriety of everything from alcohol to straws to pills to smoking, anything and everything I ever did. I never did needles, never did heroin, but everything else I pretty much dabbled in, and some more so than others. But, um, you know, I found that it just, I just got tired, sick and tired of being sick and tired, and I got into a 12-step program, went to Oasis. Treatment Center sponsored me, a gentleman named Jim A., who uh, was the original uh, interventionist on the TV show for A&E. And always wanted to get a child actor sober if he could. And he chose me. I was lucky enough to be the guy that he, that he put his faith into. And uh, we're still in contact. I'm still doing speaker meetings. And uh, I go to. I don't really work a normal program. I can't sponsor people because I'm on the road a lot. I do dear a lot of people into the program by example. And I kind of let them know where to start and how to get help and uh, try to guide them to take that first step. That's kind of what I do. That's great. Inspiring others to be able to to follow in that positive path as well. And congratulations on 13 years. It's quite an achievement. <laughs> it's awesome. Yeah, it was. It's uh, it's definitely my biggest achievement. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's. I'm sure it's addiction. Something that it's always kind of there somewhere, maybe. So I know it's something that you have to really focus on. So. It's an amazing. It's amazing. I got very lucky, apparently, because I really had like a burning bush experience for some reason. I just have to be, you know, thank thank God for that one. But I literally, they explained it to me that some once in a once in a great while that you get lucky and everything is just sucked out of you that causes you to uh, crave and, and Jones and want to do stuff and or you know you're one step away from a meeting or you're one step away from church. <laughs> I just. I've been very, very lucky that I work at a program, but I do it on pretty much on my terms. And it's allowed me to go about and uh, and have a great, great second half. So I'm happy that I made it. I did 41 years. I, fi- I, I figured it out that if I live to be 82, I'll have 41 years of sobriety total and 41 years of non-sobriety. So if I make it to 83, I'm over the 50-50 help. There you go. I'm sure you, I'm sure you will. Oh, you, know, you mentioned the Phantom Toll booth, Mel Blank in that. Mel was the Raven. And the monsters, the voice, at least yeah. for a short period of time. Well, the Raven was several people. Uh, yeah. Joe, Con- I think one of the producers did the voice once that we had another gentleman from and Mikhail's Navy do the, uh, I'm trying to think of his name. I can't think of his name Bob off the top Hastings, of my head. Bob Hastings, I think was. Yes. Yeah. Bob Hastings. Thank you. Bob Hastings as well. And that was just, actually, Mikhail's Navy was also one of my favorite destinations when I would go exploring. Because I go out in the back lot, my uncle supplied horses to the studios, so I'd go check Uncle John where, where he was with the horses. And while I was out that direction, the lagoon wasn't far away. So I would go see uh, Ernie Borgnine was a really nice guy. And Tim Conway, I didn't really know Tim too well, but I knew that he was extremely funny. And I enjoyed the show of Mikhail's Navy to watch my, myself, so that was fun. One more question, if that's all right. You got time? Okay. All right. Fielder's Choice. Tell me about your time on The Simpsons, playing yourself, or dive into Munster Murder Bombshell at Monster Hall. 
Oh God, that was, you know, <laughs> that just ha you know, I used to go to monster hall a lot. I mean, I was up there. I loved it up there. It was, it was, you know, the guy had built the campground and Randy and his cars and stuff. Unfortunately, uh, Ken, the gentleman who was murdered, you know, when people do evil things and, you know, they have no, I mean, you throw somebody's name. What happened was just the fact that I was up there knowing the people, the guy who did it was looking to, um, or the woman in this case who did it and oversaw it threw me under, tried to throw me under the bus to save herself. And I went up and I mean, it was 16 years later, cold case. I'm so happy that it happened that they finally found the woman and justice was served. But yeah, you know, you can, you can get sucked into some really weird stuff being a celebrity. And that's a perfect example. Well, you escaped that. You got 13 years sobriety. We're headed to 50-50. Amazing career. So many great stories. Butch, thanks for hanging out with me. Would you like to share your URLs and where you hang out on social media? Oh, uh, yeah, that's, you know, I'm not, social media is something that, you know, we have a really fantastic uh, official Munsters fan group, which uh, uh, Lois Grubb uh, is the administrator. And you can go to that, the official Munsters fan group for fun. But for personal stuff, Munsters.com, I've owned it for damn near 30 years. So that will lead you to any emails or any store or anything you want to purchase, that that thing. And then Facebook, I got a couple Facebook pages. I've got a uh, an Instagram page. I'm not a big, I'm not on the gram very much. It's not one of, I'm not comfortable with that particular. It's not what I do. Uh, I have a Twitter account, BP Munster, but mostly I'm a Facebook kind of guy. That's pretty much how it works for me. Fairly easy to find. I travel a lot. My schedule is usually posted. So if you're uh, interested in running, a, you know, crossing paths, there's a, probably a very good chance, you know, as the monkeys would say, hey, hey, we may be coming through your town, you know? <laughs> amazing. Amazing. Butch, thank you so much. I really appreciate you hanging out with me. Well, we got it. It took us a few times, but we finally made it happen. So we my did pleasure. it. <laughs> oh, Butch, one more thing. I used to work at Little Caesars headquarters, and I know you did a classic Little Caesars commercial. Yeah, it's uh, actually, uh, that's a very interesting thing because we, Jimmy Walker, myself, and Evil Knievel did a couple commercials for uh, Little Caesar. We were supposed to do four. They stopped it after two because it, they had huge response to it, but everybody thought it was a Pizza Hut commercial. <laughs> <laughs> but the deal was, but the good thing that came out of it was I became friends with Evil Knievel. And I got to tell you, you know, when I was a kid, on my Stingray and, you know, doing all the things and dirt bikes and you know, doing things, Evil Knievel was a god. He was he was a god, let's face it. I mean, the, the man could ride a motorcycle and fill Wembley Stadium with 100,000 people, all want to see the greatest showman, Daredevil, one man show, P.T. Barnum, you name, you name it. This guy was just magical. And it was so cool to get to know him and be friends with him that, uh, that's one of the highlights that the people say, you know, who's the most interesting, famous people it had to be Evil Knievel. He had such charisma and such presence that whenever I was with him, I would call people up and say, if you really want to witness something, you need to come down here and say hi and walk in and meet Evil Knievel first and, you know, in person, because there's something about this guy that you'll feel. And it was funny when I, when I, the first time we were in a car together, uh, driving I, and I pretty up front, but I was intimidated. I sat down, I go, so what's with the snake river jump? <laughs> and he goes you know, thought i was gonna die but she goes 11 shots of wild turkey put me in the rocket and i thought i was gonna die that day and i go well i guess uh, i guess that answers what happened you know you, you thought it was your your uh your swan song and he goes yeah he goes that was a tough day but that was that was the first question i asked him <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's that nice. was my evil evil story what a great guy well thank you for sharing that pizza pizza all right <laughs> yeah he was wonderful that's cool all right my friend take care Take care. Thank you so much. Bye. Bye, bye. All right. How amazing was Butch Patrick? I have so many fond memories of watching the Munsters. It was so fun talking to Butch. So many great stories. Can't believe episode 300 has come to an end. Oh my goodness. 300 episodes. Huge thanks to my guest again, Butch Patrick. And another huge thank you to all of you for coming back week after week. I couldn't have done 300 without you. Thank you so much. And I'll see you next time. Thanks so much for listening to this episode of Classic Conversations. If you like what you heard, don't be shy and give us a follow on your favorite podcast app. Also, why not go ahead and tell all your friends about the show? You strike us as the kind of person that people listen to. Thanks in advance for spreading the word, and we'll catch you next time on Classic Conversations. Classic Conversations.